I build robots that play with life. They make it seem like they need us or that we need them. They can look like they care for themselves, for you, or for each other. It turns out, living things need other living things. So to make lifelike interfaces, I specialize in the illusion of need. Modern technology can move, act, and even speak in a lifelike way. But it doesn't appear to truly live until it exhibits need. Need is the minimum for the instinctive perception of life by life. Want to see what I mean? Are you guys ready? Find out what is it, what's in these boxes? Okay, just one to start. Okay, can you wake up? Hi, buddy. Okay, this is the fur worm. <laughs> Some of you met the fur worm during the break. Like earthworms, night crawlers, and nematodes. Oh, I'm sorry, are you good? <laughs> like, like earthworms, night crawlers, and nematodes. Fur worms are simple little guys. As long as they're held gently, they're happy. But if you handle them roughly, if you squeeze them or squash them, then they'll start to struggle. They don't necessarily like that. Oh, God, I'm sorry. OK. Um, <laughs> this is a creature composed of circuits and code. But he feels like, you're OK. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. But he feels like more than that to us. You should have seen people during the intermission. Oh my God, it reminds me of my dog. Can I touch it? Is it okay? It feels very alive to us. It feels like more than that. It's pure algorithm, though. But it gives us this feeling because he reacts to our input in a way that feels like self-preservation. And that triggers, in turn, our instinct to help preserve his life. This is a profoundly powerful reaction because living things need other living things. Living things nurture and care and cultivate. This is our strength. This is what leads us to the deep empathy that underlies family, society, and care. And these days, technologists can isolate that strength and use it to make you feel a deep connection to something that isn't alive at all. <laughs> Technically, this isn't new. Puppeteers have been doing it for ages. We see it a lot now also popping up in animation. And in creatures like the fur worm, your empathy forges a connection between you and the robotic through the illusion of need. I mean, when we squeeze the fur worm, right, we think he needs to live. When we kick the Boston Dynamics robo-dogs, we think they need to stay upright. When we play with Cosmo, a playful robot by Anki, we think he wants and needs to win the game as a part of his purpose. Need is the difference between a robot that deserves our sympathy and one we consider purely mechanical. When I sculpt the need illusion, I focus on three elements. Purpose, which you can create through consistency. Emotion, which supports purpose. And story which frames the illusion and leans heavily on associations. But let's start with purpose, the meaning of life. All things have a purpose, a drive that influences every decision we make. You're listening to me now because it underlies some purpose you have to participate in a community, to hear enjoyable talks, to politely listen until she's done speaking. The fur worm and real worms have a purpose as well. They want to live, which means they need to avoid being crushed on stage during my TEDx talk. Technically, the only indication we have of this purpose is that every time I start to squeeze him, he consistently thrashes as though he wants to get away. OK, I'm sorry. You're all right. If you create creatures that react consistently, you can create the illusion that they have a purpose. They have a drive. They want to live. Therefore, they must be alive. But just because something reacts consistently doesn't mean it has purpose or personhood. A car alarm goes off very consistently. But I don't interpret the car alarm as a sign that my car needs to stay safe. I also don't assume that the television craves a relationship with a remote, even though it very consistently turns on and off when I press the button. Car alarms and televisions may be consistent, 
but they're ultimately mechanical, not alive. The difference between robotic consistency and lifelike purpose is emotion. See, we think that robots just do, but that living things want to do. And we can create the appearance that a robot has purpose if it seems to want to accomplish its task. For a living thing, showing want means showing emotion, specifically the joy when you accomplish a task or the distress when you can't. Joy and distress can bring a robot to life regardless of how mechanical it might seem on the outside. Ready for some joy? This is actually one of my favorites. This is the little yellow drum machine. It's a joyful robot created by a technologist named Fritz Leinberg. Its purpose in life? To rock out. <laughs> Seriously, that's it. It just goes up to different objects and drums on them. Look, <laughs> it looks really happy. Despite its mechanical exterior, it kind of just makes you want to put stuff in front of it so it can fulfill its purpose and drum. So we get a sense that this little guy is joyful, which makes it seem more like he has purpose but he also reacts the same way to every single object we put in front of him. <laughs> so eventually this illusion slips away and we're left with something robotic, not alive. So let's talk about creating emotions that have staying power. Real emotions are unpredictable. Living things experience joy and distress differently in every situation. We can't possibly expect the same reaction for joy every time something good happens or the same for distress every time something bad happens. That wouldn't be life at all. That would be algorithm. So let's imagine a more lifelike emotional robot. It should have a bunch of reactions for joy and a bunch for distress. And it should probably exhibit them randomly and unpredictably. That would be much more like a real emotional <coughs> living thing. Anki did a great job with Cosmo. He has a bunch of different reactions to losing a game. He might be annoyed and angry, or just really sad. <laughs> so his distress is varied and unpredictable, just like real distress. And when it comes to simpler bots, this randomness rule still applies. The forearm can't really change his expression, but he can change the way he squirms, and the speed and amplitude of his motion varies each time he wiggles. The only consistent action written into his code is he has to twitch more when I squeeze him harder. So the furworm exhibits purpose and emotion. That's a big part of the neat illusion for him. Before we get to the third part of the illusion, I'm going to introduce you to my other friend. Okay, this is Burbles. He is a starfish cat. <laughs> starfish cats are a playful species of ocean-going, I want to say mammal. <laughs> their sandy fur camouflages them from predators while they immerse their rubbery underbellies in the water to catch fish in their sensual mouths. Not where you thought it was going to be. Starfish kittens have a hard time regulating their heat, so they usually stick close to their mothers or to the nearest source of heat and life. So if you pick Burbles up, he'll start kneading his little starfish claws in the direction of your body heat, and if you hold him close, he'll purr and attempt to suckle you. <laughs> yeah, that reaction. <laughs> when we meet Burbles, we feel two things very strongly that we need to care for him, and or that we need to run away screaming. <laughs> this is a very confusing set of emotions. We're trying to classify him, either as a cute thing that needs our help, or a dangerous thing that needs to eat us, and we kind of lose the fact that Burbles does not need us. He is no threat to us at all. If we opened him up, we'd find temperature sensors, servos, a battery, and no real evidence of life. Because Burbles is not alive, but he does employ the need illusion. And in terms of our gut reaction, that's more powerful than the robotic reality we already understand. Burbles, like the furworm, relies on purpose and emotion. He needs to be held. He consistently reaches for you and mules in distress when he's not held. He exhibits joyful purring when he is. But the need illusion for Burbles isn't just purpose and emotion. It's also story. It's all these associations we have with his appearance and his feel and his sound. All these things together make up a story 
about a repulsive yet lonely living thing that probably needs our help. The article I wrote about Burbles for BuzzFeed was called, Please Adopt Burbles, He is Not a Monstrosity. People reacted really strongly to this because the story of an adoptable, unloved animal that is weird in some ways and adorable in others was a familiar one that they'd heard before. It linked burbles in their minds with living things, with ugly ducklings, with unadopted pit bulls, with potentially dangerous but adorable alley cats. These associations made him seem less like a robot and more like something they'd seen before, something alive. But even without the context of the article, we react to burbles as though he's a living thing. <laughs> Our gut feelings of sympathy, revulsion, or both at once are generally relegated to the world of the living not to the world of bots. But we feel these emotions very strongly because of the visual, audio, and kinesthetic cues that help sculpt Burbles' story through associations. Everything we look at or create, everything we see, touch, or hear already has a story or set of stories associated with it. Let me show you what I mean. Let's consider neoteny. Large, wide-spaced eyes and rounded faces that remind us of babies. When we want to show something's cute, we use neoteny. Let's also talk about texture. We love soft things. They are so nice. They're very comforting. They're nice to touch. They make us feel good. And this is an inborn instinct. Baby monkeys will choose a terry cloth covered mother bot over a metal one, even if the cloth one doesn't produce milk. With burbles, we link texture and neoteny with purring and mewling, and it allows us to tap into a pre-existing context for sad, lost, lonely kittens that need desperately to be held. And this, in turn, invokes our emotional instinct to care for and hold them. But of course, with burbles, that's only half the story. We also get the rubbery, the overly symmetrical, the star-shaped mouth. Ugh. There are no creatures I want to hug or pet or even touch that look remotely like this. And we are tapping into terrifying associations with aliens, with horror movies, and other things that bite and scratch. And the idea that I should hold one of these things against my body or that it might suckle me is particularly revolting and just as strong as my prior reaction of sympathy and care. And that is the power of story. So we have a story sculpted by these specific associations, supported by the appearance of purpose and emotion. These three things together create an illusion of need that is very difficult to resist. We're going to feel something. We don't get a choice. The need illusion isn't actually new. Purpose, emotion, and association are used in media, movies, and books to make us feel attached and connected to a narrative. That's just good storytelling. But when it takes physical form, it is so much more powerful. This connection can feel almost involuntary. And with the pace of modern tech, you are likely to see this powerful illusion entering your physical world, making you feel connections with objects, with people, with companies, whether you like it or not. Now, I think the need illusion can be used to help create wonderful things that better connect us to ourselves and to each other. I love Pero. He's a companion robot used in Japan to help establish positive emotional connections and to provide comfort to elderly patients with dementia. And let's not forget about our friend the fur worm. He's meant to be a simple tool to inspire care and to showcase our instinct for empathy. And we can even use the need illusion to encourage and motivate us, building robots for ourselves that help us break bad habits or reach new goals. But the need illusion can also be dangerous if it's misused. It is very easy for me to make a robot that gives us a sense of loss when it's switched off, or a sense of mutual joy when you help it accomplish a task. And although you may feel you're creating a relationship with the robot and doing what the robot needs to help it fulfill its purpose, the robot is simply a tool that a technologist uses for you to form a relationship with them and to help them fulfill their purpose. And that purpose may be self-improvement or art or storytelling or human connection. Or it could be more selfish than that. 
we're talking about a method of puppeteering and manipulation that most of the public is not familiar with. And, as with jingles on the radio, or chain letters, or spam, there will be a period of intense susceptibility to these methods. Until the need illusion becomes normal, we will probably be suckered into doing things we wouldn't normally do. I mean, what are we going to do if a power company can make us feel bad about turning off a light switch? Or if Google can ransom the cloud-based souls of our robo-puppies? So I, I joke a bit, but even if it's not used selfishly, the need illusion can create accidental consequences if it's used without forethought. Imagine a robot construction worker, built with purpose, that generates a sense of camaraderie among its human peers while it works alongside them. Generally positive. But what will we do when it malfunctions on the line, endangering someone, and we have to pull the plug? In the three seconds it takes us to mentally reclassify our robo-friend as a machine, will it injure someone who's actually alive? Now, my point is not that the neat illusion is bad. The radio is not only used for jingles, and email is not only used for spam. It would be a shame if it were. I think we're going to see the neat illusion used in modern technology as it has been in traditional media for years, for incredible art and immersive storytelling, for new ways of experiencing life and connection. So my point is not that it's bad. My point is that it's coming, and it's powerful. And you should think about how you're affected by it, and how you may be affected by it in the future. Because it will affect us, whether we think that's true or not. We can think this. This is a robot. We can think that this is a robot all we want. But the illusion is very powerful. It's based on basic human empathy, the same empathy we've built into our friendships, our families, and our society. Becoming hardened to the need illusion may mean rewriting some of our own code. It may be questioning what is pre-programmed in the biological and the technological. Because this, this little guy, what we feel when we see him, that's some deep programming. I'm really uncomfortable watching him be in pain. And I think it's a good question to ask whether we're ever going to be able to see something that appears alive and feel nothing, to watch it struggle and feel nothing, to watch it die and feel nothing. Living things need other living things. And we are alive, aren't we?